Hello, everybody. This is Harina. Welcome to the bonus session of the Summer Coding Sampler. We are in between session um, 11 and 12. This is an extra session that we've added um, after playing with the software for the summer and realizing this might be something fun for teachers to learn. So I'm going to switch right over to the presentation. All right, so again, this is the bonus session. Um, we will be talking about 3D modeling through coding. And if you are here live, please op also open todaysmeet.com slash coding sampler 12. Um, and that will be the back channel if you have any questions. All right, so before we begin, I just want to talk a little bit about what 3D modeling is. So 3D modeling is used um, for modeling things in engineering and design. And it basically makes a virtual model of objects. And that model could be used for different things, like just seeing what the design might look like, or creating an engineering drawing to give to the manufacturer, or running simulation on it um, so that you can test things on the virtual model rather than testing on the actual model. Um, there, In general, those software are called CAD which stands for Computer Aided Design. And there are lots of different types out there. Um, the popular ones used in the industry are, include AutoCAD, SolidWorks. Um, and in the education, their SketchUp is popular. But there are also uh, you know, a ton of other software out there. And today, we are going to use something called BlocksCAD, which um, it, it does solid modeling, 3D modeling, using a more scratch-like block coding interface. And it, it's built off of something called OpenSCAD, which is another um, 3D modeling software, but one that does so through code. And OpenSCAD uses text-based coding. BlockSCAD uses block-based coding. And, but they're basically running the same um, code in the background. And how would you make? a 3D model through code. So the basic idea is that you have a some sort of series of basic geometries that you could use, like a cube, sphere, cylinder, and so on. And you use code to place them in specific place, specific place within your workspace. And then you combine those geometries, either by adding them or subtracting them or intersecting them in order to create more complex shapes. So if you were to create a box, for example, your first step might be to make a cube. And then you could put a smaller cube inside the first cube. So you would create a smaller cube and position it such that it ends up inside the first cube. And then you subtract the smaller cube from the larger cube, and you end up with a box. Now, of course, you could make this box by making a slab for the base and then four slabs for the walls. So there's, as in many cases with coding, there are multiple ways to do to solve a problem. And you know, making a box is a simple example, but there's multiple methods to get to the box. So why do you want to use code to create 3D models? So typically, in 3D, co uh, 3D modeling, you have an interface where you um, place blocks and, and move, move it around the space with your mouse and position them and create 3D geometries. Now, using code, you can, um, there are some advantages to do using code rather than using your mouse and other placement tools. And one of the major advantages is that you can make a parametric model. What that means is um, you can use variables for key geometries. So if we take that box example, we could have the length of the box be one variable, and then, by just changing the number of var value of that variable, you could easily change the model. So you can um, use variables to create um, models that can be resized and customized very easily and quickly without redrawing the entire thing. Um, also, you can use the advantage of things like loops to quickly create complex geometries. So for example, if you wanted to make a staircase, you could use loops and say, you know, so move, so you could make a draw a block of one step and then repeat it with an offset vertically and sideways to make a staircase really easily. If you were to do this in um, another CAD program, you'll have to run some other commands. Plus, if now you wanted to change the size or the number of the steps, you can do so very quickly if you use variables. 
Um, also, because you're using code um, and um, you can input geometries and dimensions very precisely, it's very easy to make um, models with precise dimensions if you're looking for something very specific, um, which has been a disadvantage for, for some of the 3D modeling tools that were used, um, that are used for younger grades. It's, it's the difficulty in making precise geometries. And you are using code to, uh, while at the same time learning math and 3D visualization skills. So um, it, it not only reinforces coding, but it also, you can also pick up um, math and 3D visualization skills at the same time. So um, I'm going to take you right into the program. It's called, um, it is at blockscad.einsteinsworkshop.com. Einstein's Workshop, by the way, is a um, hands-on STEM learning center um, out in Newton or some, 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 somewhere around Newton or Burlington, I can't remember. But um, they, um, they offer workshops for, for school-age children. They have after-school type programs. They have summer camp. Um, this software, BlocksCAD, was developed there for the use with their 3D printer. So whatever geometry you create on BlocksCAD, you can export um, as a 3D file and then print it on the 3D printer, which um, it's great, you know, fun if you have a 3D printer, but even if you don't, just having a virtual model could be a lot of fun as well. So I'm going to take you right into BlockSCAD. This is what it looks like. Um, I've already logged in here. I have an account. I already logged in. You don't necessarily need to make an account. However, um, if you want to save any of your projects, you need to make an account, and the account is free. So you can go ahead and make an account if you like. Uh, the basic interface is uh, very similar to something like Scratch, where you have a palette with and tabs with different um, menu items, different commands. You drag the command out to the programming area, which is this area. You have a window here, a resizable window that shows you your result. And to actually see what this piece of code does, you're going to click this Render button. And as soon as you hit Render, you will um, see the sphere appear um, on your screen. And this sphere has a ra radius of 10 millimeters. And it, you can kind of see that with this grid line. So the units that are used are in millimeters. You can change the name of your project here. Um, but um, just be careful, because changing the name doesn't automatically save it. In order to save it, you do have to click on the Save button. Um, that's one thing to be careful about BlockCAD is it does not auto-save and make sure you save often. Um, all right, so um, before I start making anything complicated, um, I just want to go over the coordinate system. So let me enlarge this window a little bit. So the space that we're working in has an X, the red, the Y, green, and the Z, blue axes. And they are um, perpendicular to each other. And by using different coordinates on X, Y, and Z, that will define where on, in this space my objects are placed. OK. And when I place a sphere, it automatically puts it right in the middle. So if I want it anywhere else, I would need to use a translate command, which is you can think of it as a moving command. Sorry about that. All right. Now, there are other basic geometries. So we use the sphere. There is also a cube and a cylinder and a torus, which is, well, I'll show you the torus too. OK, so I'm going to show, show you one at a time. So we already did the sphere. It creates a sphere with the radius, uh, prescri prescribed radius, and puts it in the middle of the space. Um, now for the cube, I'm going to hit render. I have a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, but notice it didn't put it in the middle of the space. It put it on the positive x, positive y, and positive z. That's because I have this selected as not centered, but I can also select centered and then render. Now it ends up in the middle of the space. Now that's um, whether you want to center it or not will depend on what you're trying to do with this cube after it's being placed. Um, I'm going to keep it centered for now. You can also change those dimensions um, by typing in there and create um, any, any kind of a rectangular prism 
geometry. So you don't necessarily have to have a cube. You can, this is basically a rectangular prism. Okay, so that's the cube. Now I'll show you the cylinder. Just gonna render it once. So cylinder has two radii, and if you actually kind of hover over this, it'll, it's gonna tell you what that means. R1 is the bottom radius, and the R2 is the top radius. So you can use this to make a cylinder or a cone by changing, if you change the R1 and R2 values, you can get a cone. Um, by default, these two are locked, which means if I change one of them, they will both change, but I can unlock it and use it to make something more of a cone. And I can even put zero for a second radius and really get a cone. And the height is just the height um, of the cylinder. Make a really long cylinder. And again, we have the option to center it or not center it. And if you don't center a cylinder, the circle is still, um, it's still centered around the z-axis. Shrink this so we can see it a little bit better. It's still centered on the z-axis. Axis. However, it sits on the positive xy plan, plane. Um, it sits on the positive side of the plane. If I say centered, then it drops down so that the center of the cylinder ends up in the origin. So that's the cylinder. And then we have the torus, which uh, let me hover over it and show you what it is. So torus is a, you can think of it as a donut with a polygon for its um, cross section. And you can also make it, uh, make the donut itself a polygon. So R1 is the is sort of the major diameter. R2 is the diameter of the cross section. The number of size is the number of size of the, um, of the donut, so I'll make it six. And the faces is the number of uh, faces on the cross section. And if I render this, so in this case, we have a donut that is hexagonal because I have six size. But the cross section, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is actually, if I cut this, it's a square for the cross section because I selected four for the face, okay? And the uh, radius from the center to here is 10, and then the radius of the cross section is four. So that's the torus. Okay. I'm gonna move that away. Um, I'm actually gonna put the rectangular prism back on here. And center of that. And notice how I'm rendering this very often. That's a very good practice just to keep on trying things out. Don't wait until you have a long code um, to test it out. We say, mention this every single time. Um, just keep on rendering. It's not, it doesn't uh, refresh the picture every time, so you just need to hit render to make sure it's what you're actually trying to do. Okay, so what I going to do now is show you some of the other options. So there are a bunch of menu items under transform. This is where you can start moving your geometry around. So right now, so far, we've only seen the, um, the shapes appear right around the origin. Now I can move it. So translate will move your object um, along the x-axis, along the y-axis, and along the z-axis. So for example, right now, I have this the small board-like thing. Try to position this so you can see it all. Um, so it's long in the z direction and kind of flat in the x direction. So if I move this along the x-axis, let's say by 30, now it moves over by 30. And we can also do this for y and, the, and also for z. And we can also do this in combinations. So I can say move to x is 40 and y is 20. And it, you know, so you can place this anywhere within this three-dimensional space. But um, just remember that because this cube or this rectangular prism is centered, um, whatever coordinate you put in for the translate is refers to the center of this box of the rectangular prism. If you want to work with the base of the rectangular prism, then you'll have to make sure it's not centered. Okay, so I'm going to this back. Okay, 
And the next transform I'm going to show you is rotate. Now, rotate has three angles that you can put in. And each one refers to the angle that you want to rotate around that axis. So if I um, put in, let's see, I'm going to move this over here. So I'm not going to translate. I'm just going to rotate now. Um, so, so that goes back to the origin. If I want to rotate about the x-axis by 45 degrees, okay. Remember the x-axis is the red axis. So now you see how this rotated 45 degrees around the x-axis. We can also do the same with y. Now it's the same rectangular prism, but now it's rotated about the y-axis, which is the green axis. And we can also do it around the z. Um, so, let me, so this is the original picture. And then if I rotate it about the z-axis, that's what you get. And you can put in multiple coordinates here, but it gets really confusing, actually. So um, with the rotation, it's, it's you know, the 3D visualization that you need to do to, make, to figure out where it's going to end up is really tricky. So um, you may just want to do one at a time just so that you don't get um, you don't get it all confused in your head. Um, and we can use these in combination. So for example, I can say, translate the cube. So first we had, oh, I'm going to um, snap this away just once just to show you where we started from. So we start with the original cube. Now I'm going to translate this by 40 units or 40 millimeters along the x. Now, if I say rotate this along the z-axis, axis, what would happen now is this whole thing will rotate around the z-axis. axis. So it brings it over um, and, and rotates it at the same time. So this is different than just having it move to this coordinate because um, if we just translated x and y to end up in this spot, then the rectangular prism was still facing forward, I mean facing straight. But now that we've rotated, um, it's, uh, it's pointing 45 degrees and pointing towards the middle. Okay, and it's very important when you do this translate and rotate that you um, pay attention to the order of operation. It kind of goes from inside to the out. So, um, but if you rotate first and then translate, you get a vastly different result because now you have a rotated rectangular prism that's just on the x-axis. And we go back to the way we had it before with translating and then rotating, then the rectangular prism ends up all the way over here. So you need to pay attention to where um, the order of the operation, especially when there's rotations and translation involved. Okay. All right, back to here. Now, I just want to point out one thing. There is a code button at the top right. Okay. And if you click on that, it actually shows you the actual code, the text version of the code. So we're coding in blocks, but it shows you the text version. And this is what would work in the OpenSCAD program that I just mentioned earlier, the text version of this. And you can actually export this and save it onto your computer and open it in um, OpenSCAD open if you want to. But um, I'm just going to go back to the blocks for now. You can't edit this code in here, unfortunately. You can only edit in blocks. But you can look at, the, look at what the text code will look like. OK. So this is all good. But um, we did mention that one great advantage for using code to do the 3D modeling is the use of variables. And we haven't really gotten there yet. So um, I want to show you how the variables work. So the first step to using variables is to create one. So I'm going to click on variables and just drag one of these blocks out. Now, the default name is item, but we can always change it. Um, when you click on this, you have two options. One is rename variable, and one is new variable. Um, rename variable will keep the same variable, but just change the name. And it will also change the name wherever else it's used inside the program. When you do a new variable, you also get a place to put an input a name. But now it creates a new variable. Um, and the old one stays, um, you know, the item stays. 
So I'm going to rename it since I don't want it to name, be named item. Let's say I want this to be, um, I'm going to say this is called, going to be called angle, and I want to put a number in there, so I'm going to drag this number key. And actually, it doesn't really matter whether you grab the number numerical constant or the angle constant. It's going to do the same thing. And I'm going to set it to 45 for now. And now, rather than rotating this block by 45 degrees, I'm going to say rotate it by this angle. So when you click on variable, you have the set angle to, which is where you um, set the variable. And you get this other blank one. This is where um, the one you want to use to use the variable as a numerical input. And it clicks into any of these um, other blocks. So now, if I render this, I can change the angle. And it's going to keep on um, changing where the bar ends up. Okay. Um, which doesn't seem so significant at this point. You know, I could have just changed the number here, and it's the same amount of work. But if this angle um, affected other geometries in my drawing, and let's say there were other components of my model that um, that dependent on this angle, then rather than having to go in there and change every single one of them, I can just change this one number and everything will change right away, which makes it much simpler to actually make things. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm going to start a new project. And by the way, as you save your project, it's going to end up in a list under My Projects. And all of your old projects will end up there. And if you try to go to any other page, it's going to ask you if you want to save your project or not. Um, I'm going to save it just because. And so I have all these bunch of things. If you want to start a new project, you click on New. So I'm just going to quickly demo a project. Um, my task now, my, uh, I'm going to try to design a face of a clock. Let's say I wanted to make my own clock. Okay, so usually when people make a design a clock, they they buy the clock movement and the hands from somewhere else. You know, they, you can buy really cheap ones for like five dollars, and then there's a shaft that needs to go through the face, um, and then you just mount mount the clock movement in, in behind it with the uh, clock hands in the front. Then you get a clock. So I'm gonna start out with a plate, um, like just a flat cylinder. But instead of putting numbers in here, I'm going to start out with a um, with um, a variable, and I'm going to call it radius. For that's going to be the radius, the large radius of my clock. And I'm going to put in 100, which is 100 millimeters, 10 centimeters. It's a, it's about four inches. And I will say. Um, make the radius of the cylinder uh, equal to the radius. And I'm also going to make a second um, variable called thickness. And the thickness, I don't want it to be too thick. Let's say 5 millimeters, which is slightly less than a quarter of an inch. Um, and then I am going to put the thickness in here. So now I have this big round plate that's going to be the main part of my face of the clock. Okay. Um, one thing is, as, as these commands start getting longer, you can shrink them. I'm not going to shrink them now because you will not be able to see it on the webinar. Another option you have is to say external inputs, which um, puts all the different inputs into um, separate separate rows. So it um, it, take us, it takes up more space vertically, but then it, you can see um, it, you, you know, things won't be running off the page sideways. Um, that's a preference thing. Um, I'm going to go back to inline input. So that's, again, the basic face. Now I'm going to make a hole. And notice how I'm doing duplicate. Um, if you just right click on something and say duplicate, it's a lot of times it's much faster than going into the menu and selecting something. So I'm going to say a whole radius. And usually those clock movements have a, have a shaft that's about five millimeters. So I'm going to say three 
millimeters for the radius, which will give me a six millimeter hole, um, enough, enough to make sure the hole um, is big enough for the clock hand. So once again, I'm going to um, copy this. So now I have the hole radius. And I'm going to use, oh, before I do that, I forgot to show you these things. Well, <laughs> let me do this first. So the height of this, I'm just going to make it something big. All I need to know is that it needs to be bigger than um, what my plate is. So if I render this, now I have a face with a stick coming out of it. Okay. So um, I, I totally forgot to show you the set ops. Set ops menu stands for set operations. And this is very important when you're trying to combine geometries, combine the basic shapes to get a bigger, um, a, a bigger shape. So there are four different things you can do with them. Union will combine two different shapes, and they'll just add it into one geometry. Difference will subtract one shape from another. Intersection will com uh, combine the two, two things and uh, just take the parts, take, take the pieces that are um, intersecting. And then hull is um, an, an interesting one. It, it combines it. It is similar to union, but it also adds this like kind of a smooth shell around the whole thing. So I'm just going to show you the entire um, the four the differences using these two geometries. So um, I'm going to make this hole a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Let's see. All right. So now we have um, the hole. So. Uh, let's see. So if I do union, it's, it's basically you're not going to see any difference. So I'm not going to do it right now. Um, the t although it does come in handy later if you want to do something like, for example, you want to put a hole through both of these things, or you want to apply some sort of other transformation to both of these things, like translate or rotate. Then you, um, using the union to combine them together will help you by just making one block one geometry that you need to work with. Um, if I do difference, um, and I can say the, the plate minus the other the cylinder in the middle, this is sort of what I was trying to get at to make the hole for the clock. So you notice that it made a hole. Now with the difference, um, if I switch the two, then you get something very different. Because now I did the small cylinder minus the big plate. So it just kind of shaved off a little layer on the bottom where the plate was. So you need to make sure when you do the difference that you do things in the correct order. Um, the, the order of operation does matter when you do difference. Um, the third one is intersection. And in this case, these two geometries are intersecting right over here where um, the smaller cylinder is kind of sitting on top of the large cylinder. So if I do this, it leaves you with the part that was intersected. Okay. And then finally the hull. So, let me show. so this is where we started with the hull option basically covers the whole thing in like in this uh, smooth sheet, which um, is very interesting. You can do kind of um, interesting things with it, like make us spiral or like or um, geometries that otherwise you couldn't really get. Okay, so in our case, we want to do the difference. Remember, we, we were trying to make a hole. So I'm going to shrink my cylinder again and put it in the difference. And now we have the clock face with a small hole in the middle. Okay. So now I want to make 12 markings, some sort of marks markings around the clock to mark where the, where the numbers are going to be. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, centered. So let's say I make a cube that's kind of intersecting with the plate. And I'm going to place this cube all around. Okay. And I don't really care about the length because I'll worry about that later. And to place this, um, let me make this a little bit taller so it's easier to see. And in order to do that, I'm going to introduce loops. Okay. 
So we mentioned before that using loops, you can quickly replicate and do things to your model. And in um, BlocksCAD, you basically have a for loop, and that's all you have. And as soon as you pull out a loop, it already comes with a counting variable, which in this case is i. And because I want 12 of these cubes, I'm going to say 12. Oops. And I'm going to count up by 1. So it's going to go from 1 to 12 and counting by 1. You could change any of these variables to change the number of, um, a number of cubes you get or number of time loop goes around. Um, I also want to move the cube so that it, it you know, distributes itself around a circle. So this is where the transforms come in. So the first thing I'm going to do is to translate it along the x-axis, but not quite as far as the radius goes. So we can use some of these math operators to change that. So I'm going to say radius times 0.8. So it'll kind of place the cube, um, you know, far along enough, far enough along the plate, but not quite off the plate. And then I, I want to rotate this about the z-axis. And the amount that it's going to rotate is going to depend on this variable i. So we have i. And if, if we have 12 markings along the clock face, each, the angle between each of the markings is actually 30 degrees. So um, we are going to rotate this by 30 degrees each time I goes around. So now I have my 12 um, marks, just like that. Now we could also do something like, let's say, let's say right now, um, right now my marks, um, the cubes are pointing with the flat side pointing to the hole. What if I wanted, wanted it so that the, um, it's kind of like a diamond where the pointy side is facing um, the hole, then I can rotate this before I translate it, I can rotate it by 45 degrees. What that would do is it's going to place the cube on the, at the origin, rotate it 45 degrees before it brings it out and starts rotating. So now if I render all my cubes are pointing to the middle of the plate, middle of the hole. And so I have all these things coming out, but now I want to actually make these into holes again. So I already have this difference um, operator, my, which subtracted this hole from the big plate. I'm going to click on the plus button, which creates another place where I can put another thing in for minus. So now it's going to take the original plate, subtract the first hole, and then subtract all of these 12 holes. So now I hit render, and now I have this beautiful plate with 12 holes, and the hole in the middle that could be then be create, uh, made into a clock. Okay. So that's sort of how um, to work with this. And and you know, again, if I wanted to change, let's say I got a new clock movement, and now my radius of the the shaft was one centimeter. So I could change this whole radius to five, and just hit render and get a new drawing right away. I can also change the size of the clock if I wanted a small clock smaller clock, um, I can change things around. And any of these could be uh, made into variables. I didn't, I just, for the, you know, the cube, the holes, I just used the default number of 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter, but that, those things could also be made into variables as well. So any number of these is customizable. Um, oh, I want to show you one thing with this loop. So we said we went from one to 12 counting by one, but let's say I wanted this, let's say count by threes then I just have you know, four, four markings instead of 12. Maybe that's what you want to do for your clock. Or I can even say six, and I just have a mark on the top and the bottom. So this is where the beauty of this coding comes in. Um, if you were doing something similar in AutoCAD or um, other solid modeling, you'll, you're going to have to do a lot of redrawing. Um, but in this case, you can just put numbers, um, change numbers around and just keep on um, customizing your files. Okay. Um, there are, um, I just want to show you a couple of different things that um, could be done with this. If you right click on any section of these code, you get several options. Um, 
One is this add comment, which is very important. Um, you get this little question mark button, you click on it, and you can um, put a comment in, which will help you keep track of what your code is doing. Because if you customize all of these and make a big code and then come back to it later, you may not remember what any of these things were. So it does help to put comments on it. The other thing you could do is um, collapse the block. So let's see, let's take a look at this loop. Um, so let's, I'm gonna put a comment in here. Um, these are the square holes. And this loop takes a lot of space. But you know, after it's all done and programmed, I don't really need to see this whole thing anymore. What I could do is say collapse block, and it will shrink it down into one block and leave the comment in there so that I know what this does, but I don't really need to see the, the details of this. And that helps you shrink the program to a much more manageable size. You can always say expand block to get it back if you want to go back in there and edit. Um, another useful thing you could do is um, disable block. So if you say disable block, it kind of grays it out, and basically it will ignore that, those blocks. And now if I render this, I don't get those holes anymore. But this is a really, really great tool for debugging your uh, program. If something isn't quite working the way you think it should be, you can always um, disable it and enable it. Um, or if you have geometries that are overlapping and you can't see one of them because one geometry inside the other one and you, you, you can't really figure out where it is, you can always disable it and then um, it'll, it'll definitely help you debug your program. Also, um, another nice debugging, um, debugging um, practice is just to kind of peel away these sections. So right now I have it, you know, I already have it subtracting from the big plate, but if you, let's say this hole wasn't quite right, and you couldn't figure out what was going on. You could peel this away. It'll still render, but now it's not going to subtract. So you can see exactly where this is, and that way you can, um, it'll, it'll be much easier troubleshooting than when you can't see the geometry that you're working with. Okay? Um, oh yeah, so we talked about this, um, the hull operation before, but you also see the hull checkbox in, in loop. Um, I'm going to peel this away for a second and disable this. So right now, all we see are the 12 blocks. Now, if I click the hull option in your loop, it will actually um, connect all 12 of them together. And it actually didn't close the loop because it went from the first one to the 12th one, and I never went back to the first one. But um, but it, let's say I'm going to, if I say go from 0 to 12, then it'll actually close the loop. And this hull option is really cool um, thing that you could do. Um, I will show you some examples shortly of some things that I've programmed already. But um, you can make a lot of different geometries using this hull option. All right, so back to that. Um, enable. And back to the clock. OK, so I'm going to go in and actually show you some examples. There are some built-in examples in here that are um, interesting to look at. And one of the things, one of the ones I want to show you is this any size box. Um, just save that. And the any size box program has the width, height, depth, and the wall thickness of the box. And all it does is it creates a box. But this is sort of what we talked about um, before with the, uh, with the PowerPoint, um, with this process. But instead of taking two cubes and subtracting, um, in their case, they did, um, actually, no, they did do that. Sorry about that. Yes, so they had one cube with, the, uh, with depth and height. And then they made a smaller cube here, which subtracted the wall thickness, and then took the difference. So that's one of the um, pre-built programs that you can play with. And you can you know, change the variables. And again, this is where really the beauty of this um, coding comes in, is you can really customize this really quickly um, and get a whole range of different shapes. Um, and then I'm going to show you a couple of examples from what I've made. Uh, don't save. Let's see, the first one I want to show you is a 
where did that go? Sorry about that, oh, ball bearing. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of the code. Um, I'm just going to render it once and show you what it, what it does. It's got a bunch of this different variables. Now, you'll notice that as your program starts getting larger, it will take longer and longer to render, um, which is not, not a huge problem, but um, it will take time. So just I just want you to be aware of that. Um, Let's give it a second to whirl around. All right, so while it's going, I'm just going to talk through this, um, some of these variables. Oh, there it goes. So this is a model of a ball bearing. We can select the number of balls in there, the radius of the balls, the outside radius and the inside radius of the casing and the thickness. And there's a bunch of other options you can set in that um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention, but um, so again, the, the fun thing here is, you know, we can keep on playing with these numbers and let's see, I'm going to change that to a smaller ball, but I'm going to put more of them in there. And if you had a need for a specific ball bearing, you can have one model and just change the numbers and instantly get um, a new file, which is really cool. And once you have this file, um, I'm going to wait till this renders. But you can export this, pro, um, this file as an STL file, which is a um, standard 3D model file that could be used in a lot of 3D printers. So in this case, you, know, you can say generate a STL. Which will put, uh, um, which will save the STL file on your computer, and then you could print it on a 3D printer if you have a 3D printer, which um, we happen to have. So I'm just going to show you what happened with that. So this is a ball bearing that was printed out of one of those files, and it really actually works, which is kind of cool. Um, it spins pretty well. This one has seven balls and some. Um, and, and the way it works is these, the groove that's holding the ball um, is shaped and um, sides so that the balls don't fall out. And the things, you know, this, these are completely independent pieces on the outside and inside, but they don't fall out because the balls are keeping it in place. And, um, and so you can really make a ball bearing of any size using this program. Back to my program. And let me show you another one. Um, let me just say save. So I also have a program to make gears. And the funny thing about gears is, um, let's say you were trying to design some sort of geared mechanism. Um, you can't just randomly design shapes of gears. Um, the gear the dimension of the gear teeth need to be very specific. And if you have two adjoining gears, they need to have the same size teeth. And if you have, um, and, and you know, because you can only fit a discrete number of teeth around any diameter gear, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of difficult and tricky to design a gear. You can't, I can't just shrink this gear and you know, have it be half the size. You, you, kind, you, know, you can't, you, you need to keep the same um, teeth shape and size while you expand and shrink the gear. So having a program like this, you can change the number of teeth and actually the, the dimensions will change accordingly. So if I wanted a gear with 12 teeth, and the reason why I'm, uh, my controlling variable is the number of teeth is that's really what counts when you're trying to calculate gear ratios. So I can design a gear with 12 teeth, and it'll size the dimension on diameter accordingly. I can also change the size of the tooth, but I'm going to keep it the same. And then let's say I want to make a gear that is 24 teeth, which will then have a gear ratio with this one of 2 to 1. Then it generates it automatically. And it keeps the same size and shape of the teeth while it places, around, um, places it around um, the perimeter. 
and it automatically calculates what kind of diameter and what kind of circumference it needs to fit 24 teeth in there. And again, this, you know, if you were trying to do something like this in SketchUp or AutoCAD, it would take a lot of different, lot of time trying to um, redo the math to make sure everything fits. But in this case, as soon as I have one tooth set, I can just calculate um, everything else based off of that variable and have it generate the file automatically. Um, one last one. So this is kind of a mathematical model. Um, this program makes a, I'm gonna change one thing, something called, well actually, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna do 0.5. So this, this file creates a Mobius strip. Now a Mobius strip is, um, it's a ring. If you imagine a strip of paper and then you twist it halfway and then you tape the ends together to form a ring, that's a Mobius strip. And it's, it's kind of a mathematical concept. And it, it creates a, um, a ring with no, with single surface. So if you imagine you're walking on the strip, you're walking on the top side. And then by the time you come over here, you're walking on the inside of it, and then you end up on the bottom of the strip as you come over here and around. It's a little bit hard to explain, but, um, and you basically, this is a uh, strip with a single side. And what this is doing, um, I'm gonna undo this hull so that you can see a little bit what's going on, is this geometry was created by um, using these bars that are, that rotate around um, a circle, so it's another displace and rotate, but it's also rotating um, around the x-axis before it's sent out to the space, uh, sent out into a different location on the y-axis and then starts spinning around the z. Um, and then, if, so if I hold this again, I can, um, actually I'm gonna change this number so that it renders a little bit faster. So again, we have that. Now, the funny, fun thing here is I can change the number of twists. This n is the number of twists that, that are happening. If I say one, it makes a complete twist. So it's not a Mobius strip anymore. But now we have a slightly different geometry. Just show, you, show it to you without the hull so you can kind of see it better. So the strip, um, the bar starts sideways, twists, and until when it's on the other side, it, it is sideways kind of twisted 180 degrees, and then it keeps on twisting. We can add more and more twists to get very interesting geometries. And this one, and then, so you can, um, and you can also change like the length of the bar and do a bunch of different things. And again, if you have a 3D printer and if you have students interested in jewelry design, this might be something fun to do with them. And it is very mathematical. Um, you know, you need to understand how angles work. You need to understand uh, and be able to visualize how things rotate and, and move in 3D space. So it's really using a lot of, a lot of the part, parts of the brain that you don't usually use. Um, and again, I said um, it does, rendering does take time as your geometry gets complex. Um, you can, so right now I'm, I'm going from zero to tw uh, 320 and counting by 12s. But um, if I change this to counting by, let's say six, then what that does is add more of those bars, which will give you a uh, smoother geometry, but it will take longer to render. So it's a trade-off. You could definitely work with a, a coarser um, geometry when you're still uh, playing with it and troubleshooting, but then once you're done, you know, you see how much smoother that got. Once you're done and you're, um, if you are going to really print it or if you want to um, get a screenshot to get a picture of your geometry, you may want to um, make the mesh mesh a little bit finer to make sure you get a nice smooth geometry to work with. So now I, I'm down to three, which means um, I'm going to have a lot more bars that are rotating and that, that's why it's taking so much longer but we will end up with a much smoother geometry at the end. And we're just going to keep that, let it go.
And you could actually see that this is a really simple geometry. What it's doing is it's taking the cube, rotating it around the x-axis, and then moving it along the y-axis, and then rotating it again around the z-axis. And then the whole thing is inside a loop. So it's, it's a very simple program. Um, but you can make different, different shapes out of it. And this is really taking a while. Well, while that's rendering, I'm going to show you the 3D printed version of that, um, which is here. So this is the, the Mobius strip. This had the half twist. Okay. So this was just with half twist. And this is the same program, but used with, a three, with three full twists. So it's much more twisty. And you can really like take, take this in your hand and see how that little bit of math changes the geometry so much. And um, there's actually a lot you can do with this program in math, especially if you're in high school and you're learning sines and cosines. You can do a lot of different spirals and knots and really fun stuff with it. Um, oh, here it comes. I'm going to go back to the rendered version. So here it is. It's a much smoother geometry. So if this is, if it's your final draft, you want, you're going to want to take your time and make, um, you know, make sure, even if it takes a long time to render, um, just let it take its time and give you a smoother result. So um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Um, actually, before that, so one, um, I'm going to show you the code one more time. So I did mention that there's the text-based code for that will work in OpenSCAD, and it, you know it looks like a standard set of codes. <laughs> and the OpenSCAD is here. It's it's at OpenSCAD.org, and this is. Um, this is just the website. I don't have it downloaded on my computer, but this is basically a similar version of BlockCAD. It's got a few more features, but it's it's text based, and you know it's it comes down to a preference thing or your experience level. But um, you can see what the code may look like even from the BlockCAD. And so, if you're interested in looking at the text version, you can see it here at OpenSCAD.org. So I'm going to bring you back to the presentation. Where was I? OK. So in terms of additional resources and extensions, um, the BlockCAD does come with some um, documentation. So we already looked at some of these examples, but you're welcome to look at more of these built-in examples to give you more idea of what the coding looks like. You could also go to help and go to documentation, which will take you to this page. And it shows you the different parts of the screen, menus, and it has description for all of the menu, uh, menu buttons, the blocks. Although some of the descriptions are not very helpful, but um, but it, it's you know it's definitely there. So uh, make use of it. It there's also a small tutorial, step-by-step um, -step tutorial on how to build a cup using the BlockCAD program. Now, whoops. Now, we focused on BlockCAD today and mentioned a little bit about OpenSCAD, but there are a lot more out there to do 3D modeling. Um, one of them is SketchUp and Sketchy Physics. Is, you know, SketchUp is a very popular 3D tool, but um, most people use it without the programming aspect of it. But it, can, it has some aspect built in that you can customize and program things on your own. And Sketchy Physics actually lets you do um, simulations, uh, real physics simulation using the, um, the pieces that you you drew in SketchUp. Um, there's also OpenJSCAD, which is kind of like OpenSCAD, but in JavaScript. And then VitoBlocks is another block-based one that um, was fun. I couldn't get it to open today for some reason, so I don't know if it's still up. But um, So there are other tools out there. The reason why we chose BlockCAD today was just because it was really nice and simple, and we thought it will be something easy for um, easy to show in an hour. But we will have more PDs coming up hopefully in the fall. Um, we don't have a schedule set yet, but we will definitely announce it um, once we know, um, once we have a schedule for these upcoming PDs. So for your assignments for this um, session, you have the exit ticket like we always do. And then I want you to get into BlockCAD and create a parametric model of a three-tiered cake. Now, what I mean by that is I want a three tier, three tiers of cake, which you know each of each tier is going to be a cylinder. Then I also like to see some candles on top, 
and at least some at least one decorative element. Um, I'm gonna explain what that means in a second. Um, you can add any other details as you like. Um, I, I, um, the users must be able to change the size of the cake and the number of candles, which means those things need to be variables. Now, you may have other variables in there as well, but that's just the minimum requirement. And when you're done with that, I'd like you to take a screenshot of it, just showing your code and the cake. Um, you don't necessarily have to show the entire code, but at least some piece of it. And then just describe what you did, um, what, you know, what processes you used, and which variables you used and why, and then post that into the forum. And just as so this is sort of what I'm talking about when it comes uh, when I'm talking about the three tiered cake. So this is a three tiered cake with 12 candles on top. And it's got some uh, bumps that are resembling cream on the second and the first tier. And then I put some flowers on the bottom. So this is um, a step beyond the minimum requirement since the decorative elements I'm talking about could be just one of these things. Okay. Um, but in terms of recommendations, I would recommend you to sketch it out on paper first. What that's going to help you do is identify and label key dimensions. So, you know, doing this, you will know that there are three different diameters that we need to worry about. And you need to decide, you know, how many of those are going to be variables or are some of them going to depend on another variable? So, for instance, you could have just one variable for the base, the, the bottom tier. And then you could say the top one is going to be 80% of that and just kind of calculate it that way. Or you could have the user input all three diameters. That's really going to be up to you. Um, same, um, the only other thing is I did, I did say you need to be able to specify the number of candles. So that needs to be put, um, put in and you're gonna have to use loops in order to create these candles. And that's gonna be similar to what we did um, in the clock example earlier in the webinar. So if you need to see how that was done, um, go back to somewhere halfway through the webinar and take a look at those, um, the whole, um, the clock face holes again. And you should be able to see how to make geometry rotate around and, um, and duplicate itself in a circle. Um, don't forget to use the disable block to, uh, to troubleshoot and also just peeling it away um, from, um, and then kind of, if, if you're doing difference or um, or rotate or anything, if you peel it away and take it away from the function, it'll be easier to troubleshoot. And again, render often and test as you go. So you know, once you have the bottom tier, you want to render, make sure it's really there. Then you have the second block, you want to render, make sure it's there. So keep on testing as you go. Okay. So um, we have we just have two more sessions left. Session twelve is the face-to-face -face hardware sampler, which is going to be on Thursday, August 25th, 10 to 12. It's going to be right here at Bowling on the third floor. So when you come on in, um, you're gonna have to check in with the security desk and come on up to the third floor and we will have somebody waiting at the top of the elevator so we can let you into the floor and we will um, tell you where to go from there. And um, th we have a packed agenda, so please arrive on time. We have a lot of fun, exciting activities planned for that day. And then after that, in the afternoon from 3 to 4, we have our final session, which is the MIT App Inventor. And I, I believe Nick is going to be hosting that session. And one last reminder, um, all assignments for any of these sessions are due by the end of the day on Monday, September 5th, if you want to get PDPs for this course. Um, if you don't, Want the PDPs? The videos are going to be available at any point. Um, they are not going away. So feel free to take your time. But if you do want the PDPs, you need to finish everything and submit everything by September 5th. All right. So I think we are good for the day. Um, hopefully, we will, we will see you all at the hardware sampler on Thursday. All right. Bye-bye.